I said this at the beginning of the show, this, we've never had her on the show before, but Lori Unum to a lot of us is a hero. Uh, and I, I said earlier to you guys that uh, we talk a lot about how many people's arms you're in and that you may not know it, but at some point you have been in Lori Unum's arms. She is an amazing mom of three boys. Uh, she is also uh, someone who in her previous life, and we'll talk to her, she is a lawyer and was uh, litigating before she came to the autism community. She is currently the CEO, I want to make sure I get this right, the CEO of CASP, which is the Council of Autism Service Providers. We're going to talk about what that is. She is the founder of something called the Autism Law Summit. She also co-authored the book, Autism and the Law, and that's just scratching the surface. What I really want you to know is that Lori Unum is the driving force behind why we have insurance in the 50 states that we have it. She is the person who made it her business to go out and make sure that states adopted uh, laws and policies so that you guys could have the services that you do here in the United States. So I'm so pleased to welcome her here for the first time. Ladies and gentlemen, Lori Unum is here. Hi, and I Hi, and I forgot to say how stunningly beautiful you are too, which is always an amazing thing because when I read your bio and I, don't, and I left out so much, Lori, but when I read all the things that you have done in your young life, and then we see you and you look like somebody who could be modeling. Um, it's a little intimidating, Lori. I, you know, um, I shower several times a week when I have a podcast coming up and I look horrible <laughs> the rest of the week. Just like I don't believe it. No, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so thrilled that you are here. As I was saying, this is the first time that, that we've had you on the show. Uh, and I, I have no excuses except that I will say, I, I said this earlier, I don't think you heard it. I, I said, I have, I'm always thrilled to meet people who are doing the good work that you're doing. But I'm always a little intimidated when I know I'm talking to somebody who's smarter than me. And you clearly are smarter than me. But I'm I'm also grateful because you've been able to do things that I, nobody else could or would do. So but I want to go back to the beginning, Lori, and talk with you about, you know, you were this amazing attorney, litigator and, you know, uh, law professor and doing amazing things in your life and your career. And how did autism come to be a part of your story? Tell us your autism origin story. Probably in a way that's very familiar to many of your listeners. I, I think there was probably nothing um, particularly noticeable or outstanding about the way it came into our family. Um, I will say that there were problems at birth. When, when I had Ryan, he was my firstborn and um, I had what's called an abruptive placenta. So he was ox oxygen deprived at birth. And so I do remember the nurses in the NICU kind of saying, oh, you might wanna watch his development, this could cause problems. And so I guess I had that little bit of a nudge to be looking for things, but even with that nudge, um, I didn't really know what I was looking for. I, frankly, I didn't really know what autism was back then, right? Um, I think your child is about the same age as mine, right? Ryan is yes. 20 now, and how old is yours? Jem's about to be 18 in about okay. a week and a half. So, okay, yeah. so we're a little, about two years apart, but, um, but right, we just didn't know that much about it back then. And so really it was at his 18 month old well child checkup when the pediatrician was asking all the typical questions. Well, does he say this? Does he say that? No, he doesn't say any of those things. And I think it was my mother who first mentioned the A word to me. And I reacted in a snotty way, I think. I was kind of like, mom, what are you talking about? He doesn't have autism. But looking back, I didn't even know what it was. I don't know what made me say that because I didn't know what it was. Um, so, you know, from that 18 month old follow up appointment, we just learned what a developmental pediatrician is. I had never even heard of that. 
and waited months and months for our appointments. And then by the time he was about 22 months old, that's when we had the official diagnosis. So probably a story that's familiar to many. Yes. But how on earth did you get from there to getting that diagnosis and not really knowing what it is to a, a seminal law on the books called Ryan's Law after your child, which was the game changer, Lori, in autism and insurance. How did you get from that first space to, to that? Well, when Ryan was diagnosed uh, by the developmental pediatrician, we actually, this is awful to admit, but we had him triple diagnosed because I had been on the waiting list for so long trying to get an appointment by the time they called me up, I wasn't about to turn it down, whether we already had the diagnosis or not. So he was diagnosed at Johns Hopkins at, at Kennedy Krieger, um, re-diagnosed at Georgetown, triple diagnosed at Children's National Medical Center. We were living in Washington, D.C. at that time. And all three of those very fine medical institutions recommended that he go into ABA. And of course, I also didn't know what ABA was at the time, of course, but I looked it up, I learned about it. And um, we, living in Washington, DC was a fortunate thing because we had access to some ABA outfits that came into our home to educate us about what it is and how it works and all of that. And then they educated us about the cost of it. And I'll never forget that moment. Um, my husband and I were sitting, he, he was our firstborn, as I said, so we were just in the family room with Ryan and they kind of spelled out that for a 40 hour per week program, which the doctors had recommended for our son because he was, he was pretty severely impaired. Um, you know, they added it up and they said, well, you'll have the consultant level and then you'll have the technician and maybe a mid level. And it equaled like 70 something thousand dollars a year. And I remember turning to my husband and saying, oh, thank goodness we have health insurance. What would you do if you didn't have health insurance? Shannon, at the time, I had no idea that health insurance wouldn't cover this. All I knew was the doctors at Johns Hopkins told me to do this for my child. And I've been paying for health insurance my whole working life. So I just assumed there would be coverage. Um, and of course, it was devastating to find out that there was none and that if we wanted to pursue the course of action that the doctors had recommended for our child, we would have to pay for it 100% out of pocket to the tune of $70,000 per year. And, you know, I just, um, I mean, it's such an emotional time anyway. Um, and then to add that financial burden on top of it, it was just a very difficult time. But fortunately, my husband and I were both working full time. We were both lawyers and we said, OK, we're going to do this. I mean, we'll, we'll make whatever sacrifices are necessary. And we basically lived on my husband's salary and we used my entire salary to pay for ABA. I was teaching law school at the time, which is not you know huge money, but it's good money compared to the average family. And so, um, so we started ABA for our son as recommended and to keep it going. Like at one point we sold our house and moved to a less expensive house so that we could maintain the level of intensity that had been recommended. But it just got to the point where I was thinking, this is crazy. You know, we're, we're able to make it work for Ryan because we're very fortunate. Um, what about your average family? What in the world is your average family supposed to do if autism suddenly is part of their lives and the doctors have recommended ABA? What if they don't have a second salary to sacrifice? What if they don't have a house to sell? You know, it just, um, I, and I think you'll understand this as a mom, you just, again, going through so many emotions and it just broke my heart thinking about the moms who were going through all the same emotions that I was going through, but on top of it, they were not able to get for their child the one thing that might have just changed their entire life trajectory. And I yeah. just, 
you know, it's a knife in the stomach to think how awful that would feel as a parent to know there's a treatment that undeniably works, but you can't get it because you're not wealthy. Yeah, it's horrible. But what I love is that you didn't let that go. And this is, I talk on the show a lot about how, you know, sometimes we're in other people's arms and we don't know it because you know, it can feel like you're alone. And this is why I said to them earlier, we were all in your arms. We were all in your arms when you thought that. And so with your extensive knowledge of the law, how did you even begin to tackle this? Where'd you begin, Lauren? So, I mean, I couldn't let it go because I couldn't sleep at night thinking about how awful it must feel for those families. I couldn't sleep at night thinking about the kids themselves who would never have the chance to succeed with ABA. And that seemed so grossly unfair. And so I just was consumed with the inequity of it all. And so um, my family had moved to South Carolina, which is my home state by this time. And I was teaching law school there. And really it's funny, it started with um, the Dean of the law school one summer said to me, you know, you need to write an academic, a scholarly article to be published in a law review, choose something that's of interest to you. And I thought, well, I'm going to write about this. I'm going to write about the lack of insurance coverage for autism treatments. And I started writing this article. And just a few weeks in, I'm like, I can't do this. I'm not writing an article about it. I'm going to write a bill to change it. I didn't want to just write something that people would read and say, oh, you know, that's fascinating. (laughs) You know, I I, I threw threw away the article and, and just wrote the bill and not was I had been to law school sure I'm a pretty good writer but I had no idea how to write a bill I had to like start from scratch and figure out how you do that um, but but I knew very plainly what I thought the law should be and so I literally sat down at my kitchen table this would have been the summer of 2005 and I wrote out a little two paragraph bill I had researched other bills, you know, to try to understand how to write it and uh, just wrote out two paragraphs that just said very simply, if you're a health insurance company in South Carolina and you're insuring someone who gets a diagnosis of autism, you must cover evidence-based treatment as recommended by the doctor. Simple. And I was just naive enough to think, well, this is easy. This, this is common sense. I'll, I'll just take this to the legislature and they'll pass it. And yeah, that wasn't how it happened. <laughs> but you got there. I can't even imagine. I mean, I really think there needs to be a movie of the week about that, about how you got there. It, and we could talk about who you want to play you, Lori, in the movie. <laughs> who do you think? Like, <laughs> Uh, I, there are so many, like, I think Shalise Theron needs to play you. Oh. Like, uh, that would work, right? For sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, you know, powerful, intelligent woman, um, saying, you know, my kid needs this and it's not enough for me to be able to get it, but you know, I got to make sure that other people get it and it makes sense. Um, but then having to scale Mount Everest to make it happen, um, and, and I, you know, but I think, I think I would watch that movie of the week. I think we all would. I think HBO should make that movie. There we go. I've said it. Let it be in the, in the universe. But you got there and I don't know what it took for you to get there, but I know how much it changed everything, Lori. Um, I have so many people who talk about you reverently in whispers uh, and, and who are so grateful to you that I know uh, that Mark Knight from Project Hope says this is what changed everything and and has made it possible for him to do the good work that he's doing. Because it couldn't have happened without without what you're doing. Um, But then you didn't even stop there. Then when people saw how effective you could be in South Carolina and that you could change that, then there was a whole series of events and, um, you know, we could get into that. I've said a lot about what happened after that, but uh, basically the, the 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 whole impetus got turned to the states. That each individual state had to come up with what, 
how they were going to do, what they were going to do, what they were going to fund. And I remember that day where I just like put my head up against the wall and hit it several times and said, how is this a good plan? How are we going to do that? How is anybody going to do this? How are we going to get from point A to point B? And what I didn't know was that once again, we were in your arms, Lori, that you uh, then took on a very big task uh, working along with Autism Speaks, um, that you were going to go state by state. So Herculean, I can't even imagine. <laughs> like, I kind of want to know what was the conversation around your dinner table when you said to your family, yeah, we're going to go do this state by state. Was was anybody like, oh my gosh, we're never going to see you, mom? No, they were like, do we get to go with you, mom? And, okay. And they did a lot. They did a lot. But let, let me just, let me back up just a little bit and say. Sure, tell the story. You know, even in South Carolina, there were many people involved who were critical to the success of getting the legislation involved. I wrote the bill, I got it started, but the first thing I did was reach out to autism families all over the state to ask for their help. And that was critical in South Carolina and it was critical in every state. Um, I, I, I think it would make a great HBO movie because of how many people came together to effect change kind of in the seventh grade civics kind of way like you learn about this in seventh grade civics and you learn that this is a democracy and the citizens have a, a role to play and they can you know and it's just it was carried out exactly like in the textbook and you know um at least in south carolina when we started um, that was before autism speaks was was part or before i was part of autism speaks we didn't have a lobbyist we didn't have stationary. We didn't have a parking spot at the at the state capitol. Like we had nothing. It was just moms and dads showing up and earnestly saying, "Look, my job as a citizen is to educate you about a problem that you might not know about, and I bet you don't know about this because you wouldn't have let it persist this way if you did." And you know, that it common sense. I keep picturing that little, the schoolhouse rock cartoon with the little pudgy guy going, I'm just a bill. Oh yeah. I'm only a bill. And about you getting him to the point where you say, congratulations, now you're a law. Uh, like that had to have been amazing. And, it, and I'm sure that you couldn't have done it by yourself, but Lori, you, I mean, the bill is named after your child for a reason, uh, right? You got this done, girl. Well, you know, it was it was a very gratifying, very frustrating, very difficult in South Carolina two year journey. In some states, it was even longer than that, and in some states, it was shorter. But but I also, it would have never happened without Autism Speaks because after the bill passed in South Carolina, that was June of two thousand seven. Autism Speaks reached out and said, hey, this seems like a really good piece of public policy. Why don't you come work for us full time? And that'll be your mission is to drive, I mean, not drive, go around the country and try to get this passed in all 50 states. And, you know, as much as I would have absolutely done that on a volunteer basis, had I been independently wealthy, I wasn't and I'm not now either. And, you know, I give so much credit to Bob and Suzanne Wright and Autism Speaks for supporting this, for deciding, let's make this a part of the Autism Speaks mission to try to get that insurance coverage to families all over the country. And I'm just incredibly grateful that they supported it for all those years and allowed me to make it a career. Yes. Yes, well, it was to all of our benefit. Let's be honest about that. Um, and, and we could talk extensively about that, but I want to get to what you're doing right now because, you know, you worked so hard, um, for the States to be able to adopt a mandate. And then, um, you made a decision, uh, to go to something else. Like what now you are the CEO of CASP and I'm going to ask you to explain what that is, but what was the moment when you realized, okay, this mission or, or was that the reason why you realized it's time to leave and go do this other thing? Because it's it's slightly different. It's along the same path. I see the mission. But what was the decision-making process? 
Like that's a great, it's a great question. It, it was 2019 and 2019 is the year that the 50th state came on board. Tennessee was number 50. And, um, you know, of course, that's not the end of the journey. It, it was an end, but there's always work to do when you're dealing with insurance companies and, and making sure there's adequate coverage. But it was sort of an end. And CAS, frankly, the Council of Autism Service Providers, um, I had long been speaking at their conferences and considered them friends. They found themselves in a position where their current executive director for um, health reasons, the health of her child, um, wasn't able to serve. And so they needed a new leader and they reached out to me. And, and initially I said, you know, no, I'm, re I'm really happy in my job at Autism Speaks. And even though it's 2019 and we're hitting this great milestone, I still have work to do. But then Shannon, I really stopped and thought about it. And I thought, you know, I think I could make perhaps even a greater impact from this point forward working with the provider community, because what we what we saw was that, you know, there are some ABA providers who have been around a very long time and have been doing this well before there was ever insurance reimbursement for it. But yeah. there are many, many others who were motivated to get into this field because of the avail availability of insurance coverage. You know, suddenly it's a sustainable business model and potentially profitable. And so I thought, you know, having played such a large role in creating that consistent funding stream for ABA, I now feel some responsibility to protect it and to make sure, you know, I. I wear my mom hat all the time, no matter who I'm working for. I, I'm working for the Council of Autism Service Providers, but I'm a parent. And my interest is in making sure that consumers, families are finding quality providers who are doing good ABA because we're in, we're, we're in danger right now because of the proliferation of funding. We're in danger of there being um, less good ABA spread about and families don't know. Yes. I mean, you're singing my song, Lori. We talk all the time on this show. I mean, when we, we started the show 10 years ago when there wasn't the insurance funding and we were talking about ABA and explaining to people what it was and, you know, grants and things that you could do in different programs in different states. And then we went through the whole uh, thing where more and more states were getting insurance funding. And then at a certain point, I realized because of the questions that that families were asking and the things that they would call and say, well, I, you know, we're doing ABA. We heard about how great it was. We're doing it. It doesn't sound anything like what you described, Shannon. Yeah. And I would ask a bunch of questions and I would go, you're right. That doesn't sound anything like what I'm talking about. And, and I remember it shifted. I said, OK, we're going to talk about ABA, but we're going to talk about quality ABA because apparently there's ABA out there that is not quality. And for me, that is always, I have to make that distinction all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and people write in all the time and say, what's, you know, what are the hallmarks of, of quality ABA? How can I know? And I, I think that, um, that CASP can help people to know. Tell our viewers what you guys do to help them to feel comfortable in making their decisions. Yes, that great question. Uh, so Ca the mission of CASP is to cultivate, share, and advocate for best practices in for autism providers. And so, you know, when when we see this proliferation of, of ABA providers and some have better quality and more experience than others, I mean, the first thing we want to do is help the others, right? I mean, I, I'm not going to assume that you got into it for illegitimate reasons and you're just after the money, but it may be just that you haven't been out of school very long, you haven't been practicing that long, and you just need help along the way of figuring out what are the best practices in ABA. So the, the first kind of part of our mission is to identify, cultivate, put together, and on pieces of paper that people can read, here are the best practices and share those throughout the community and then advocate for through their for their adoption. So, I mean, we are a, a provider trade association CASP, but more and more we see families coming to our website to try to figure out, 
oh, is there a good ABA provider in my area? And, you know, I embrace that aspect of it. Um, it it's not the core function of CASP to, um, to help families provide good ABA, but I think it's, it is an important piece of what we can do uh, for the industry. So we have resources like um, a, a resource that used to be part of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, the practice guidelines for um, healthcare funders and managers is now CASP. Uh, the, BC, the BACB transferred that to CASP um, a year and a half ago. And so it sets forth things like um, what should a caseload be of a typical BCBA? Like if, if you are going to find ABA for your child and there's one BCBA for every 50 kids there, that's probably not a good thing, right? The, uh, the BACB guidelines um, indicate that, you know, somewhere from or the CASP guidelines that were put out initially by BACB, you know, maybe 10, 12, 16 um, cases or kids per BCBA is what you should be looking for. And that varies depending on what type of case it is, whether it's a nonverbal aggressive child versus a child that um, needs social skills help or whatnot. So they're not hard and fast rules, but they're standards that, uh, that providers can use to measure themselves by and families can use to try to find quality ABA. And I think this is so important, Lori, because the, you know there are so many different factions and everybody has their agenda, right? Parents, caregivers have one agenda. We have self-advocates and they have a very specific agenda. Providers have you know, their agenda and insurance has their agenda. But at the core of all of it, if it was a Venn diagram, what we want is what's best for the individual and to have it overlap in there. And I think that you guys play a really important role in that. I'm wondering, though, part of the frustration that I currently, while I am so thrilled that we have insurance funding, and I'm so excited that when a family comes to me that I can talk to them about ABA and in a lot of cases know that they have access to it. Not for some of our families that are um, not living in the United States. That's mm -hmm. still, oh, you know, yep. breaks my heart. Me too. But but sometimes we see, and, and I think this is typical of anything, that insurance providers um, don't yet, I think, fully understand what ABA is and how it works. Like, I think they're still thinking it's one thing. And, so, and like, I see it changing slowly. Um, perfect example, I was talking to a family the other day who uh, they have co-pays and they get charged a co-pay for every single time a therapist mm -hmm. walks in the room. And, and th this makes sense to the insurance company because they're thinking of it like therapy. You go to a therapist and, you know, you don't have therapy three times a day, but for ABA therapy, you do. And so this family has been paying a co-pay three times a day, three separate co-pays. And, and I know that it's something that's, that a lot of insurance companies have already figured out this particular one, it's still in flux, but I'm wondering, is that something that CASP helps too with the providers to have that communication with the funding sources to, to like break down the walls of the stereotypes of what ABA is or isn't to help them to figure that out with the insurance company? Absolutely. And that's a great example that you gave about the co-pays. I think the insurers, uh, the health plans, first of all, they had ABA foisted upon them because of the yeah. insurance mandate uh, reform movement, which happened, I mean, really in the span of about a decade for the most part. Yeah. And that's quick. And, and so this was foisted upon them. They really didn't know what it was at the outset. And it is just very different from most of what they're covering. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's fine to have a copay every time you go to the dentist twice a year. <laughs> um, yeah. And it's it, it, an entirely different matter, as you say, to impose multiple copays per hour or visit or therapist or whatnot. And and just that very copay practice is absolutely cost prohibitive for some families. Um, I, I love, I'm going to give a shout out to um, my own health insurer is Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, who 
um, not, not through any of my doing, on her own, basically decided to do away with co-pays in ABA. Not uh. only, you know, to scale it back to one a day or one a week or one a month, they just basically said, look, if, if we believe that getting kids good quality, high intensity ABA is going to lead to reduced cost over their lifespan, which we know that it does, let's make sure they can get it and let's make sure they can get it at the right intensity. And so they just did away with co-pays altogether. And it's a blessing for those families. Yeah. Um, yeah. I want to, I want to write them a nice thank you note, uh, you know, because it's that kind of thinking that we need to get to. So, but, so my question is, does CASP help providers to figure out, make that bridge with insurance companies? Is we that do. something you guys do? You do. Yes, absolutely. We are, um, we talk to the health plans all the time. We talk to insurance companies. We meet with them. Two of my colleagues in government affairs from Autism Speaks, Mike Wasmer and Judith Orsetti, have now come over to CASP as well. And so the whole team really that worked on the autism insurance legislation now makes up the government affairs and public policy department at CASP. And so we uh, love nothing more than to work with providers or families and help them resolve those insurance issues and, and help the health plans understand, no, that's not really the way we do it in ABA. This is what it is. I love that because we need, we need people advocating for that. Now, uh, you know, a less comfortable subject is that, uh, you know, it's always around this time of year that um, there's a large group of people uh, self-advocates, all of whom I love. And I always say, you know, they have the right to speak whatever their truth is, but they will come forward and say that ABA is not a good thing, that they are opposed to it. You know, my distinction that I'm always making with them is I, you know, while I hear you and I hear what you're saying, I don't think we're talking about the same thing. When we're talking about quality ABA, I don't think it's the same thing as what you're talking about. And I always invite them to come see quality ABA to tell me if it's the same thing, right? Because I want to learn. But I'm curious, I'm always asking people in other areas, like, how do you deal with the criticism about ABA from, from self-advocates? How are you dealing with that? That's a great question. Um, you know, I have been dealing with it for a very long time because um, there, there was much opposition to the autism insurance mandates in every state. And most of the opposition, of course, came from the insurance industry. Sometimes it came from chambers of commerce. But in, in numerous states, self-advocates also would express their opposition. And um, I'll, I'll never forget being in one meeting in Georgia and uh, a gentleman on the front row spit at me while I was making a presentation about autism insurance reform. Um, and I stopped and, and asked what the problem was. And, and he was on the spectrum and he was very much opposed to my shoving ABA down his throat. And, you know, I just stopped the whole conversation, the whole presentation and said, let's have a conversation about that right now, because I'm not shoving anything down your throat. I, your choice of whether per, to pursue ABA for yourself is yours. But what I am doing is trying to make it possible for those who want to pursue it. And so I would ask you to respect that choice and let me help make it possible through insurance funding. Um, and, you know, I think that did resonate a bit with that one particular self-advocate. But of course, now, you know, it's, it's well beyond just opposing the insurance mandates. There are people who just oppose ABA altogether. And, and I would agree with you. I mean, I think several things. One, there are all different kinds of ABA and they may not have ever seen good quality ABA. Two, there are all different presentations along the spectrum, of course. And I will say in my own family, I, I, I only ever talk about my oldest son, Ryan, but I actually have three sons and my youngest is also on the spectrum. And he is the polar opposite end of the spectrum from Ryan. So I am living at my dinner table every night, the entire breadth of the spectrum. And 
my youngest son, we have not gotten him ABA. Um, he is mildly impaired. He is able to advocate for himself. He's um, very intelligent. He's very verbal. Um, he needs some help with things here and there, but it was a just complete different presentation than, than Ryan. And so I think that, um, I mean, this is not completely unique, but I have a somewhat unique perspective just seeing the entire spectrum in my household and, and understanding and believing that not everybody on the spectrum needs to be treated with ABA. But those who do benefit from it tremendously and need it greatly if they get good quality ABA. And my firstborn, I mean, I, I don't know where we would be. I don't know where he would be. And I don't know where our whole family would be if we had not been able to access ABA for him because, I mean, he was extremely nonverbal, highly aggressive, self injurious, all of those things. And, um, he did not overcome all of that entirely, but he got to the point that we can live a pseudo normal family life. And for that, I am extremely grateful to all the ABA providers who have been in our lives. I love that. I wish we had more time. Unfortunately, we are out of time. We're past time. Where can we send families if they want to get more information? Um, we were saying CASP, that's because I know somebody wrote in and asked, it's C-A-S-P, you guys. And I wrote it into the chat, Council of Autism Service Providers, and Traven put uh, the website into the chat. For, but for people who are listening, where do you recommend that they go, Lori? Yeah, well, come, come right to that website, caspproviders.org. And we have a constantly evolving website. We're updating with new resources all the time, just updated it over the weekend. Um, and we love to hear from families, consumers, anyone, anyone. Um, we're growing. Uh, we, we have added 62 new organizations to CASP in the last six months, and um, which is great. I, it's, it's wonderful to see the community coalescing around this nonprofit trade association to advance the field, to promote and educate about ABA generally, and thus to help the autism community as a whole. Wonderful, and you are a very gifted keynote speaker, and, and I'm sure as the world starts to open up more, there's gonna be opportunities um, for you guys to see Lori speak, which is an amazing thing. Um, and I encourage you, if you're at an event and see that she is on the agenda, get to hear her speak. I know. It's life changing. So Lori, thank you for all that you have done and all that you are continuing to do. It's such a pleasure to meet you finally in this way. And because um, I've been aware of you for a long time and been grateful for you for a long time and sorry that I, I like I seem to have missed you about 35 times. Um, even, well, back, even back to the, at you, Shannon, because I've been aware of you for a long time as well. So I was thrilled to see the invitation to be on Autism Live come across. Well, email. we're excited to, to have had you here. Uh, but in any case, we are totally out of time. So I want to thank you and thank your team for making it possible for you to be here with us because I know you're super busy. And we'll look forward to having you back on again. There's so many other things we could have talked about. But thank you so much for being with us. I would love it. Thanks very much. All right, you take care. Thanks for watching Autism Live. If you found anything helpful in this video, please give us a like. In fact, make sure that you smash that subscribe button on YouTube and give us a like on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram for important updates. And please download our free podcast wherever you get your podcasts. See you next time. Until then, give your kiddos a hug from me and one for you too. Bye-bye for now. To subscribe, click here. And if you'd like to check out some more of our videos, click here.